We have quite a lot uh, to look at tonight. If you want to grab your Bibles and turn to the book of Luke chapter 10. And the plan is to get through chapter 10 and a little bit of chapter 11. So while you're turning there, I uh, just wanted to announce that starting April 13th on Wednesday nights, we are opening up our second classroom in the Children's Church, and it's going to be from four-year-olds to fifth graders, so we'll have two classes open. Yeah, so that's a, a great deal going on there, so praise the Lord for that. So... You guys all right? We good? So Luke chapter 10. After these things, the Lord appointed 70 others also, and he sent them two by two before his face into every city and place where he himself was about to go. And he said to them, the harvest is truly great, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go your way. Behold, I send you out as lambs among the wolves. Carry neither money bag, knapsack, nor sandals. Greet no one along the road. But whatever house you enter, first say, Peace to this house. And if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest on it. If not, it will return to you. And remain in the same house, eating and drinking such things as they give, for the laborer is worthy of his wages. Do not go from house to house. And whatever city you enter, and they receive you, eat such things that are set before you, and heal the sick there, and say to them, The kingdom of God has come near to you. But whatever city you, you enter, and they do not receive you, go out into its streets, and say, The very dust of your city which clings to us we wipe off against you. Nevertheless, know this, that the kingdom of God has come near you. But I say to you, that it will be more tolerable in that day for Sodom than in the day for that city. So what we have here is Jesus commissioning now the 70. We've seen previously he commissioned the 12 to go out. Now he's expanding that. Jesus is about six months away from the cross. And he is in an area here, a particular area called Perea, which is an area on the east side of the Jordan in an area of people that are mainly rebellious against the Jews. And so Jesus sends out his disciples and we see the, the preview of really what the Great Commission is, that it wasn't just the 12 that were to go out and preach the gospel, that that was the, the church's responsibility. This is a prelude to that. This is the ordination and the commissioning of people, really the church in general, to go out, to go out and make disciples. And you'll notice as they went out, they were to go out in a certain way, certain prescription. And that's important because God does have a, a prescription. He does have a plan for how we are to go out. The, the important thing to understand is that God hasn't given it to us to make up our own way of reaching people. In other words, the end does not justify the means. So when one would say that we go about making disciples in an unbiblical way, but our idea is still to make disciples then we're not doing the Great Commission. We're not going out in the power of the Holy Spirit with the message of the Holy Spirit, but we're doing our own thing. And we've seen this sort of thing um, infiltrate the church year after year, century after century, decade after decade. 
And those type of things, they always come to an end. And what happens is, as generations go on, each generation, a new generation comes up, and there's an itching or a desire to do their own thing and have their own spin on it and move away from the previous generation. And there's some sensibility to that in the fact that the culture does change. And so we don't need to look the same as they did maybe in Jesus' day. I wouldn't dress like they would dress in those days. We wouldn't have the same decorations and things like that. But the message is always the same. The foundation is always the same. And when generations start to change that, what happens is they really get off message. And the church becomes a man-made institution. And when that happens, there's no power in the church. And that's something that, that we're seeing today in our day and age, in this generation, the, the lack of power in the church because of the desire of the church to be fancy, to be relevant, to be uh, popular, to be quote-unquote influential. And just sort of a, a, a desire for something new. We love something new. We love something shiny. But I have found that there's nothing more exciting, there's nothing better than the power of the Holy Spirit working through an individual. Could it be that possibly the lack of the working and trusting of the Holy Spirit has caused the church then to try to manufacture a work of the Spirit? And to say that, oh, we are spirit-led, and yet engage in practices that actually demonstrate you're not led by the Spirit, but you're actually trying to manufacture and make something happen. And so when someone within the church or a believer, they say, well, I'm bored, or this is old-fashioned, there may be some elements of being old-fashioned, but if the Word of God is being taught and the Holy Spirit is moving, there's, there's nothing more supernatural, more powerful, and more exciting than that. And so what we see in the sending out of the 70 is we see that they, they were told not to take material things that would, one, cause them be, to be distracted, and two, cause them to maybe depend on some material things to be successful. And that's, in our, in our culture, in Western culture, church, that's often what's thought, that if, if we have enough money, then we'd be able to reach people. If we had more bells and whistles, or if we can throw money onto a problem or a situation, then we can reach more people. And we have to be very careful about that. Because it's very easy to mistake a work of the flesh for a genuine work of the Spirit. And that's something that I've always craved and I've always desired was that there would be a, a genuine work of the Spirit. And not something that we would be able to point to and say, wow, look what we did. Look what we brought up and and look, we did this thing, and then we had a whole bunch of people show up. And by the way, just having a whole bunch of people showing up is not necessarily doing the work of Christ either, right? Because you can have 100,000 people show up for a football game on a Sunday, and that doesn't mean that it's a work of the Spirit. But as I read this, I realize, one just talking about the church in general, how far the church has drifted from this commission. And secondly, 
it makes me realize how desperate we are as a church, how desperate our schools are, how desperate our city is, our state, our country, and beyond for a work of the Holy Spirit. And we need to know there's nothing, nothing that we can do that can change our society outside of a genuine work of the Holy Spirit. And I just want to want to enlist you with me and say, let's, let's pray for a genuine work of the Holy Spirit. The time is ripe for a genuine work of the Holy Spirit. As we look through the Bible and we see a, a great slumping of the church, even as we look through church history and we see the church slumping, then we see a, a work of the Spirit, a reviving work of the Spirit. And that reviving work of the Spirit is a, a work where we get caught up in it. And we realize we had nothing to do with this. We didn't make this happen. It's something we got caught up in. The Holy Spirit, for such a time as this, He decided to just move in a certain way at a certain time. And I, I don't think that there's a better time for a work of the Holy Spirit. There's a desperate, desperate need for the work of the Holy Spirit. And so this commissioning is Jesus teaching His disciples about the power that He's giving them. He's teaching them to go out and not depend on money and finances. He's teaching them to preach that the kingdom of God is near. In other words, he's, he's teaching them that, hey, Jesus is here and respond to it. And he's also saying that when you go to a town, the prescription is that to stay with the family that invites you into their house. And as you stay there, they'll provide for you. And if there's a family that doesn't want you in their house, then, then just keep going. If there's a town that doesn't want you in their town that just wants you to go, then keep going. I think that's interesting, too, because sometimes we think that receiving Jesus as our Lord and Savior is like doing Him a favor. Almost like, man, Jesus is really lucky I responded to the gospel. And here we get this idea of, of Jesus has this message. He has this power he has his disciples going out and doing everything necessary in order to convey that message. But he also is saying if someone doesn't receive that, move on. And the condemnation is going to be on them. And also notice when he goes to a, a, a city and they reject him, it, it's going to be like Sodom. So what does that tell us? That tells us that a city or a town or a state or a country, it stands or falls based on their relationship with God. We don't hear that a lot outside of the church today. We don't hear that in politics much, in media. We don't hear that the response of a family, of a nation, of a city, a group of people, however you want to look at it, we don't talk about that our response to that will determine if we stand or fall. And he, he finishes with talking about Sodom and Gomorrah in that, in that instance. And so then the second thing is we need to realize we, need a, we desperately need a move of the Spirit. And this, the second thing is to realize what the real problem in our country is. And the real problem is people's relationship with God. That's why we see... What's happening is happening. That's the real core and the real issue behind the falling of our nation. And as we see that and we watch that, we can say that's the falling of, of our world, really. We see that lining up with the Bible. But we also see that, that God is in, that, in a time like that, that He's given us this commission to go out. And notice how He describes us going out as lambs among wolves. So he describes our, our 
job as a church, or, you know, when I say that, I'm talking about individual people, people that are part of the church, people that are born again, that we're to recognize the generation that we're living in, we're to go out into that generation and understand that when we go out into that generation, that we're going out as uh, people who are hated greatly by the people we're going out to preach this message to. And so this is really the foundation of, of the gospel. This is the foundation of the Great Commission. This is not something that's changeable. So we may change the decorations, the style of music and things like that. But there's nothing that should change about this. There's nothing that we should alter. And when we do, we're not even doing God's work. So watch what happens then. In verse 13... He says, Woe to you, Chorazin. That was a, a city. Woe to you, Bethsaida. Another city. For the mighty works which were done in you, had they be, been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, who are exalted to heaven, will be brought down to Hades. And he who hears you hears me, and he who rejects you rejects me, and he who rejects me rejects him who sent me. So these are these, these cities in Jesus' time, Chorazin, Bethsaida, uh, Capernaum, which was where Jesus was staying. And he's saying that they have this heavy weight upon them of judgment that's even heavier than these Old Testament cities like Tyre and Sidon. If you recall, Tyre and Sidon was a Mediterranean coastal city that was flourishing and ended up being completely conquered by Alexander the Great to the point where nothing has ever been rebuilt there. Nothing's happening there. It's desolated. And Jesus is saying that you have even more of a responsibility, Bethsaida, Chorazin, and Capernaum. You have more of a responsibility because, because he who has given much, much is required. So there's a responsibility with the awareness of who Jesus is, the light that's been given to us, and the rejection of that. So that tells us that in some way there's, uh, there are different degrees of torment and punishment of hell because he's, he's very clear about that. There's a judgment for those three cities in Jesus' time that are greater, it says, he says it'll be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon than, than these cities. That's interesting. But then, again, let's bring that back home a little bit. What does that say to someone who has been exposed to the gospel, first of all, just being a resident of the United States and has, in God we trust, written on the back of the dollar bill and has churches on every corner and has Bible resources, anything you want is there. And the revelation of Jesus Christ has gone out to our country in such a heavy degree that those who reject that, they have to, to consider what this is saying. But then we also have to think about our own country. And we have to think about the judgment of a country that is recognized and been established upon the knowledge and the ways of Jesus Christ and now has completely rejected that. So what are we to, th what are we to think? We're to think that we're under judgment. But we're also to think that as believers in Jesus Christ, we need to pray for a revival. 
We need to pray for pe- people to be saved because the frog is getting warm, if you know what I mean. If you don't know what I mean, our country is in a place to where there's like it's like a frog in cold water and you put it in a pot of cold water and you turn up the heat on the stove. And the frog will stay in there because the water's not hot. But you just turn up the heat slowly and the water will get a little hotter, a little hotter. And the, what happens is the frog gets used to it. Until next thing you know, the frog is now soup. And the frog is now boiled. And you know what? That's what, exactly what's happening to our country. We're getting used. We're getting used to sin that is so wicked and vile. And we're getting used to that. We're celebrating that. We're calling it entertainment. We're using that to spend our time and our hours and our money and our energy. And these are things that we we see clearly in the Bible are vile, wicked things that God brings His wrath upon and it is deserving. And yet we are living in a time, especially in our country, where we are calling those things good things. And we are even embracing many of those things within the church. Churches are falling. Churches are weakening. Churches are becoming worldly. Churches are becoming rebellious and defiant, and they're doing it, and they're calling it good. And they're calling it good because they don't look at the Bible. They take the Bible away or they minimize it to such an extent where now the world philosophies are taking over the church. And when that happens... When you see that happening in the Old Testament, when the corruption of the world got into the priesthood, that was it. That would be like the red line. Why? Because when, when the church gets corrupt and worldly, then, then where do you go for answers and truth? Where, where do you go? The church... Is supposed to be that place where a person would go for truth and for light, to know God, to understand God. And I don't know if there are a lot of churches that you can just walk into like you should be and find the truth. So we are in a very similar position that we should be able to relate to when we read this. When we read this, we should feel a heaviness. We shouldn't be able to just read by that and just check it off like, okay, I just read that. This is us. This is our society. And this is why you and I will face so much persecution, opposition, That'll, that'll happen in many different ways. It's just, it's just crazy what's going on. But at the same time, when you read the Bible, you realize, well, that's exactly what God said. And it's happened fast. It's happened very fast. It's accelerating. So, what are we to make of this? This is what... Jesus is saying, and I just want to say this one thing before we move on in this one section. Jesus is saying to his disciples, to the 70, go and preach this message. You're going out as a lamb among wolves. And the right response would be that someone would hear what you're saying and they would repent. That's key. There would be repentance. Repentance. So when we pray for a move of the Holy Spirit, when we pray for a revival, 
if that's going to happen, you know what we're going to see? We're going to see a, a mass repentance. You're going to see that within the church first. And then you're going to see that moving on out into the church where people are broken over their sin. Where their heart broken, they're crying out to God for mercy. That's what a revival looks like. A revival doesn't look like a Coldplay concert. A revival looks like people coming into the awareness of their sin and being broken and repentant and asking God to forgive them of their sins. That's what a revival looks like. The good thing is, in verse 17, there was a response. So in verse 17, the 70 came back, and they came back with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. Which is interesting, because when Jesus sent them out, he didn't say anything about casting out demons. But see, they obeyed Jesus and went out according to his plan in obedience. They did what he said. They didn't go out and say, well, Jesus said to do this, but let's just do this instead. They just did exactly what Jesus said. And there was a power there. And the power was there going out and they were saying, hey, the kingdom of heaven is near. And there was repentance. And within all that, then the demonic kingdom was dramatically affected. The the, the demonic strongholds and the power of darkness. So they're back and they're like, Jesus, this is amazing. We went out, it was amazing. And even the, the demons, they, they couldn't even handle it because the, the power, they, they didn't know that this power was so powerful. And they couldn't wait to tell Jesus about it. And so in verse 18, he said to them, Jesus says, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. He said, behold, I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. So as they come back and they're all excited, what are they excited about? They're excited about what they did and what happened. And Jesus acknowledged what had happened. And then he, he gives them sort of a warning because it, when God works in your life, it's easy to make the thing that you do the big thing. It's easy to, to make, I witness to somebody and, you know, the, the thing that we do, that, that, that becomes, the, the work becomes the thing. And Jesus is saying, be careful of that because I saw Satan fall from heaven. And he said it was like lightning, meaning it was quick. He fell quick. And what, he, what he's saying is, it was pride that caused Satan to fall. And he says, that's, that's great that you went out in obedience and experienced the power of God, but, but that's not the thing. The thing is that your names are written in the book of life. The thing is you're saved. So... Everything that we do comes from what He has done for us. That is so important. Whatever ministry, whatever service, whatever we do for the Lord, we have to know it's coming from this huge revelation and understanding of what God has done for us. So I, I'll give you an example. I could sit up here and study till my eyeballs fall out and sit up here and, and feel good 
just about teaching, just doing the teaching. Just feel good about that. And God says, be careful, buckaroo. Be careful that that's not the thing. But that teaching of the word comes from what I have done for you, the greatest thing, the greatest thing. So this is what we boast about, that Jesus saved us. That's our boast. So it's very important that we don't make our service or work to the Lord our thing. That's not the thing. We can even make that our identity. Like, hey, did you know I do worship? Hey, I'm in the worship group. That doesn't mean anything. The fact that you're saved and God has rescued you and maybe given you an opportunity to share a gift with the people and the people respond, hey, they're actually singing. I can't believe it. I think I heard them sing a little today. That's not the thing. What we do is never the thing. Our thing, our identity, the biggest thing about us is that Jesus saved us. That's the biggest thing about us. And whatever we do for him, we have to do it from this sense of awe that he saved us. We have to do it from that. If our service to the Lord is is not from the sense of awe and gratitude to the Lord, just this brokenness to the Lord. If it's not because of that, but it's, it's just about the thing we do, then we need to be very careful because pride will set in. And when that pride sets in, that's what he's telling disciples, don't let that pride set in. It's not about the thing you're doing. It's about what I have done for you. Isn't that a huge lesson? It's sort of Jesus, it seemed like he kind of, nip that in the bud really quick. Like they, he can sense that they're getting sort of self-confident, like, hey, we like this. You know, we're, demons are being, you know, and, and he's like, wait a second. He's like, that's not the thing, right? That power, I gave you that power. I could take it away. And you know what? He did because there was a point, you remember, when the 12 went out and then the three went up on the Mount of Transfiguration and then the disciples that were down, they couldn't cast out the Spirit. That's why they're getting prideful. They're, they're thinking, hey, it's about the thing. No, stop that. There's nothing greater about what we do than the fact that Jesus saved us. So Jesus says in verse 21, He says, In that hour, Jesus rejoiced, In the Spirit. Now, it's interesting because we don't hear that phraseology and terminology about Jesus very often. This is one of the few times that we see it recorded that Jesus was rejoicing in the Spirit. And that word rejoice is is like super abundantly rejoiced. So we get this very unique perspective of that Jesus did have a lot of joy. The book of Hebrews, chapter 1, I think it's verse 9, it says that he was anointed with the oil of gladness gladness above his companions. So if you were to encounter Jesus, he is a man of sorrow, but he had to have this great joy. It's kind of, kind of interesting, right? But if you're a believer, you kind of know what that's like because you do carry this heavy-heartedness, being in this difficult world and seeing people lost and hurting and you see that, but then you have this amazing joy in the Lord at the same time. I don't know how that works, but I just know it's a, it's a fact. It's a reality. So Jesus was a man of sorrow, but he had great joy. And so now he's rejoicing in the spirit. I think that's key too. but our joy is in the spirit. So Paul said, don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the spirit. So there's this amazing joy that happens in the spirit. And it says, Jesus says, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven 
and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and the prudent and revealed them to babes. This is what made Jesus rejoice in the Spirit, exceedingly, super abundantly rejoicing that this revelation of who Jesus is, it was a mystery. And a mystery not like, you know, who done it type of thing. A mystery meaning in the Old Testament, it wasn't revealed and now it's being revealed. The kingdom and Jesus and and his salvation is being revealed. And Jesus is rejoicing at the people that God is using to reveal that to. And in, in essence, he's saying, these are babes. These are not the aristocrats. These are not the people in society that are the big shots. God is revealing, I would say, his greatest mystery to regular people, to not the high and mighty, but to regular people. And that just made Jesus so happy. And I I just, that's one of the thrills that it is to be a Christian and to experience God revealing himself to another person. There's nothing better than that, really, is for God to use you to reveal him to another person. When that happens, it's the greatest joy that you can possibly have. And so Jesus is rejoicing because God's revealing. So it does show that to know God, there's a, a God has to sort of open someone's eyes to, to reveal himself to people. And he says, you have, in verse 21, second part, you have hidden these things from the wise and the prudent and revealed them to babes, even so, Father, so it seemed good in your sight. All things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows who the Son is except the Father, and who the Father is except the Son." and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal Him. So that's what we need to be praying. It's very easy to want to change behavior, but in reality, we need to be praying for changes of hearts that affect the behavior. Behavior is just a symptom of the heart. And the change of heart and the understanding of Jesus in the heart is something that has to be revealed. So how is that revealed? Well, the Word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. But we also know from the parable of the sower and the seeds, we also know that we have a responsibility. We have a responsibility to be receptive and soft-hearted and open to the Word of God. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, it says, when we believe, we see. So all these are sort of wrapped up in this. There has to be, the I don't know how to put it a better way, but to me it's kind of like a divine spark has to happen in the soul of a person, and that's where we need to be praying. And it's amazing because I was just uh, reading... I think it was this morning in the, in the one-year Bible in Deuteronomy where it talks about that God would change their heart, the changing of a heart. And it's interesting to talk to you and know a lot of you and to hear about how you were before and to see you now. And the only real explanation of that is God changed your heart, that you're not the same person. And that's the the beauty of a church body, is he's taken all these sinners from all different walks of life, and he's touched our heart, and we're in love with Jesus. And we come together, and we worship him, and enjoy him, and enjoy him in one another. That's a, that's a sort of like God's, the church is a, a gift that God has given to believers on the earth, that, that we can enjoy 
fellowship with like-minded people and be able to experience God working in other people's lives. And that's the thrill of being involved in a church body. So that's what he's saying. So in verse 23, it says, He turned to his disciples and he said privately, Blessed are the eyes which see the things that you see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings have desired to see what you see and have not seen it, and to hear what you hear and have not heard it. This is crazy. Think about this. The Old Testament prophets were writing stuff they didn't even know what it meant. So as God worked in these people's hearts to write His words, they didn't know what they were writing. And they wanted to know. They wanted to understand. Imagine writing something, and you're like, I have no idea what that means. Just write it. Okay, I'll write it. What does that mean? Don't worry about it when it's revealed. But think about, think about how blessed we are to live in this time. Think about the privilege. And do you ever think, like, oh, I wish I was there when Jesus was walking the earth? Yeah, me too. That would have been cool. But think about this. We live in a time where we, we are able to look back and see the fulfillment of the prophecies of the Messiah coming and the historical faith that we have is rooted and grounded in history. So we have that to look back on. And then we have that as a foundation to look forward to the things that God says are going to happen in the future. So we're able to say, as God has historically and literally fulfilled His prophecies in the past, He's going to still do that in the future. So we are very privileged people to be living in a time where we have seen the fulfillment of those prophecies and then given the Holy Spirit to be able to live according to God's plan in this time. So the need for the Holy Spirit cannot be understated. So in verse 25 it says, And behold, a certain lawyer stood up And tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? When he says eternal life, he's not talking about a duration. Because the Jews all believed in an eternal life. They all believed in an afterlife. He's talking about a, a quality of life. He's talking about a spiritual life. He's talking about a life lived in fellowship with God. So this lawyer, this, this person that would be very astute in the law, he's a, he is a lawyer in Judaism, like a scribe. And he sensed that something was missing. He sensed that the law wasn't completely fulfilling him and bringing him that quality of life with God that he was looking for. Sounds similar to any of you? We just read not long ago about the rich young ruler. Very similar. He came to Jesus in the same way. What must I do to inherit eternal life? So now we have a second account of a different person asking him that. And Jesus says in verse uh, 26, he says, What is written in the law? What is your reading of it? That's exactly what he said to the rich young ruler. He took him back to the law. It's interesting. So in Jesus' discussion with people, in their desire to have this quality of life, of fellowship, of spiritual life with him, he, the way he does that is he takes them to the law and wants to know what's their understanding of the law. So what's the law? The law is the Ten Commandments. Why would that be something important for one to have eternal life? or fellowship with God, because the Ten Commandments are God's moral laws or moral expressions of His heart. God is a holy God. So the law 
expresses his holiness in moral values in order for us to be able to measure ourselves against to understand if we can have eternal life with him. In order for us to have eternal life or a quality of life of fellowship with him, we would have to be able to be the same morally with him. We would have to be equivalent morally. We would have to, in other words, have the same holiness as he would have in order to have fellowship with him. That's why Jesus takes people to the law. And that might also be a good tool for you when you're sharing the gospel with someone. So he answers in verse 27, he says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. So he's sort of summing up the law in a correct way. And he's summing up, saying it, it's love. A supreme, this, this lawyer, the scribe, he's saying to have this quality of life, of spiritual fellowship for eternity with God, he's saying the law says you have to have an ultimate, supreme love for God in every aspect of your life. So let's just hang out there for a second. What this means is that you and I have never not sinned. You and I have never loved God with all of our heart, soul, strength, and mind. We've never done that. Not one second of our life have we supremely loved God with all of our heart and all of our soul and all of our strength and all of our mind. We've never not sinned. And because then this lawyer is pointing this out, and then he says, the law says we're to do that, but then we're also to love our neighbor as ourself. We probably have never done that either. Especially if we're not rightly aligned with God vertically, we're not going to be aligned with people horizontally. Now, we may be able to have some sort of relationship. A lot of relationships that we can have are mainly based on common interests. That's why people, you know, they form like clubs, like mountain biking club and, I don't know, agriculture club, gardening club, summit club, rotary club, whatever. They form clubs and you, can, you, you have that thing you're kind of, united in. But that's not really what Jesus is saying. And this is not what this lawyer is pointing out. And he's sort of indicting himself, but he, he's saying that our love of God must be supreme and perfect from every aspect of our life internally and externally. And then were to then have this love for people, this, this deep love for people that comes from our love from God. So Jesus says in verse 28, he says, you have answered rightly. So that's right. And he says, do this and live. But he, wanting to justify himself, said to Jesus... Well, who's my neighbor? Because the Jews only thought their neighbor were Jews. 
they wouldn't consider someone from a different ethnic background someone their neighbor. They wouldn't particularly consider someone from the area that they're in or the Samaritan people or the Gentiles, any non They wouldn't consider them their neighbor. So he's thinking, well, I think I do that to my fellow Jews. So he says, well, well, who's my neighbor then? So Jesus' question sort of got him thinking because he knew he was missing something that, of that spiritual relationship. Even though in his mind he thought he was keeping the law, which we see he, he wasn't, but in his mind, but he knew he was missing something. And many people come to faith like that. They know they're missing something. I'm doing pretty good in life, they may say, but it's empty. I've accomplished my goals. I've uh, been able to do th some things in this world. There are people who say that, you know, give me a lot of pats on the back. And, and so I feel pretty accomplished, but that won't fill that spiritual need that every human being has because we're made in the image of God. So because of that, we desire relationship with God. We desire the things of the Spirit. And without that, we feel unfulfilled. We'll always feel unfulfilled, unsatisfied. And what do we commonly do to make up for that? Find other things to make us feel better. And when we exhaust that, we can go on to another thing and another thing and another thing. Until we finally come to a place, hopefully, where we realize, like, nothing is satisfying me. And this is where Jesus is going with this lawyer. So who's my neighbor? Notice how someone who's living by strict rules, they, they have to really have a certain prescription for life. They have to just, so, okay, well, who's my neighbor then? They, all these technical things. This is what someone does when they're not fulfilled and satisfied in Christ. It's trying to, trying to find that eternal life in something else other than Christ. So here's what Jesus says. He says, a certain man, he gives him like a little parable. A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho, which is a very dangerous, well-known dangerous road to go on. And he fell among thieves who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Now, by chance, a certain priest came down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. That's what a, a Jew would do because this was a Gentile. So uh, a religious Jew would not feel compassion or love for somebody that wasn't a Jew. So they would easily be like, oh, he's not a Jew, and walk around even though he's half dead. Oh, it's not my problem. He probably deserved it. So then Jesus is saying in verse 32, Likewise, a Levite, it's another religious Jew, when he arrived at the place and came and looked and passed by on the other side. But then a certain Samaritan, which would just really set off, or in our vernacular, trigger this particular lawyer. A Samaritan, I just make him just feel like ants are crawling on his back. Ugh, the Samaritan. So Jesus said a certain Samaritan, as he was journeying, he came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him. So they, they would think that Samaritans can do nothing good or holy or right. But Jesus is pointing out there was a certain Samaritan. He saw a half-dead man and actually had compassion on him. And that compassion actually translated into action. So he went to him and he bandaged his wounds, pouring oil and wine, and set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. On the next day, when he departed, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said to him, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. So which of these three do you think was a neighbor to him 
who fell among the thieves. And he said, the lawyer said, he who showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. So what Jesus is pointing out is through the law that your understanding of the law was so rigid that it eliminated love. And you said that the love is to have a supreme love for God and love your neighbor as yourself. So Jesus was pointing out that a true believer who is truly experiencing eternal life and the quality of spiritual life, of spiritual fellowship with God is one that's dominated not by law, but by love. God's love, vertically, in their heart, which extends to loving other people horizontally. So now, as he brings this truth home, we're not really told what happens to this individual, but the point is this. The point is that to have a relationship with God it's going to be based on His love for us and our responding to that love. That's what grace is. His love was displayed on the cross. And our receiving that love is what changes our heart. And when it changes our heart, we love God supremely. And when we love God supremely, we'll have a love for other people, a tenderness, it won't, our, our faith won't just be checking a bunch of boxes. It'll be a, a genuine, heartfelt care and concern for other people. And so we're actually just going to finish with this last little story, and then we'll pick it up. I know we're going to get into 11, but we're running out of time. So verse 38. Now it happened, as they went, he entered a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she approached him, Jesus, and she said, Lord, this is how I picture her saying it, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her to help me. Come on. And Jesus answered and said, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things, but one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen that good part, which will not be taken away from her. And so we finish with this story of Mary and Martha. And in this story, we see that this was a place in a town near Jerusalem. If you're familiar with the geography, it would be on the other side of the Mount of Olives. So the Mount of Olives would be the east-facing hill that would um, be just on the other side of the Kidron Valley, which separated the Temple Mount and this mountain, the Mount of Olives. And then on the other side of that mountain was a place that seemed like Jesus went back and forth during his last week in Jerusalem before he died. And he, he most likely would stay with Martha and Mary and anybody else? Did they have a brother? Lazarus. So Jesus was familiar with this family, and we get this. Uh, this is so important to understand because what Jesus was saying, this goes kind of back to what we were saying before previously, to where we can be so busy about doing things for the Lord that we forget the best thing is just being with the Lord. Doing for the Lord is no substitute for being with the Lord. Doing for the Lord comes from being with the Lord. And so we have to prioritize sitting at Jesus' feet. 
And notice Jesus says that when we spend time with him just sitting at his feet, that there's an eternal reward for that. Jesus said, this won't be taken away from her. So just sitting at the feet of Jesus will give you eternal rewards. And our sitting at the feet of Jesus, our devotional life, our personal quiet time life, we, in my opinion, and I think I'm backed up scripturally, should not be serving if we don't have that. Because what we give out comes from what we take in. If we don't take in, we have nothing to give out. And so it is vital that we spend time with Jesus. It is vital that we just don't have a life of doing things, but we have a life of being at the feet of Jesus, of hearing from Him, of enjoying fellowship with Him, of talking with Him. You know what that does? It, it makes our heart tender. And sometimes we can just be people that we're dominated by just doing the work of the ministry. We just do, do, do. And you know what happens? We get crabby. We get crabby. And you know what happens is we get crabby, and then we start getting mad at people. How come they're not doing what I'm doing? And we get frustrated. And there's nothing worse than a, frustrated, burned out servant of the Lord. And we will get burned out if we don't spend time with Jesus. And that's something that I've had to learn the hard way over the years. And I think I'm at a point now where that's my favorite part of my life is just spending time with Jesus. So let's take that lesson home. Let's finish there. A lot of things to really uh, glean on and chew on. But as we just sort of put this all together, this, let's just remember to keep our eyes on Jesus. Just the, the simple faith in Him, the simple adoration. I think many of us are probably carrying around so many burdens tonight that aren't ours. And Jesus says, Take it easy. Just sit at my feet. Right? You're all distracted and all these things. And he's saying, I got all those things. Come to me. If you're weary, if you're heavy laden, I'll give you rest. And God is giving us, or he's letting us off the hook. He's saying, you don't have to worry because I have it under control. I'm letting you off the hook. When I made you, I didn't really equip you too well for worrying. I didn't put a good worry gene in you. So stop worrying. I can worry, God says. God said, I'll worry for you. But you just enjoy me, trust me, and watch me work.